testing. Testing one to three. Testing one to three. A little bit more. All right. God bless you. Amen. We're going to go in prayer. With your body heads, you close your eyes and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God of heaven, thank you again for this day. For this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you for your outstretched hand and your tender mercy. Look on us on tonight. Meet the needs of every loving soul here tonight, God. Let the yokes of the enemy be destroyed because of the anointing. Let the hand of God move upon us. Give us understanding of thy word. For you said the entrance of thy word giveth light. Lord, the entrance of thy word giveth light and light up our pathway. Show us the way, O oh God. Strengthen us, O oh God. In Jesus' name. Let Satan be bound on every hand. Those that are the sick and afflicted under the sound of my voice. I pray that you would heal their bodies from the crown of their head to the very soles of their feet. I decree and declare deliverance and breakthrough in their lives. In Jesus' name. Jesus Have your way, God, Have your way, in this place on tonight. Let the glory of God be revealed. Open up our understanding that we may know the ways of the Lord. In Jesus' name. Have your way, O oh God. And we give your name the praise, the honor, and the glory. Let all of God's people say, thank God. Thank God. Amen. 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 God bless you. So glad you tuned in on today. You that are listening on Facebook. Amen. We'd like to encourage you to uh, hit the share button. Amen. That others may hear it. That we may delve into the word of the Lord on tonight and speak the word of God. Now, tonight we're talking on laying on of hands. The laying on of hands. They shall lay hands on the sick. The Bible says, and they shall recover. The laying on of hands is a doctrine of the church. It's one of the doctrines of the church, the laying on of hands. When you lay hands on people, uh, you can lay hands on them to be healed and delivered. You can lay hands on them to be devils to be cast out of their bodies. You can lay hands on them to ordain men and women to the gospel, ordain them into a, a, a place, a position in the church. So the laying on of hands is very important. And a lot of times we don't really look at that uh, enough to understand the importance of the laying on of hands. And a scripture that I always quote, a familiar portion of scripture, I'm gonna ask you to turn to, to it tonight. Mark 16. <clears throat> and 17. Mark 16 and 17. You can quote it, but you know, sometimes we do ourselves injustice by quoting the scripture and not learning how to, amen, find it and know where it is and memorize it. Mark 16 and 17. Turn there if you will. <clears throat> and it says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. And these signs shall what? Follow them that believe. Now that word follow, another word for the word follow is these signs shall accompany them that believe. So if you are a believer, these are some things that you need to know as a believer you should have and you should operate in. And these signs shall follow them that what? Believe. believe. Or these signs shall accompany them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, number one. They shall speak with new tongues, two. If they drink, and if they take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall, and they shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and the sick shall recover. I want you to know that the last thing that says that we will be able to do through the power of God is 
they shall lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. Laying on of hands, what we're talking about tonight. How many of you have been to churches where you've seen people lay hands on people, have prayer lines or have called people up to the front and they lay their hands on them? That is for a purpose and a reason. And there is an anointing on the laying on of hands when a person that's laying their hands on you are anointed of God themselves and full of the power of God. Now, there's a such thing called laying empty hands on empty heads. What do you think that means? That means the person that's laying hands on you do not have, does not have the power of God in their lives or operating in their lives and so their, their hands are empty, void of the anointing and, and they're laying hands on your head Probably you don't have nothing in your head, and so, amen, uh, empty hands on empty heads. But you get the point. When a person lay hands on you, it should be an indication of the anointing of God that's in their hands, that there will be a transference of that anointing out of that person, that man of God or woman of God's hand, into your head or into your body, that will bring an anointing a healing and deliverance. We take so many things for granted that I thought we would take time out tonight to go over this, one of the doctrines of the church is the laying on of hands. I spoke earlier that the laying on of hands can be done to effectively cause a person to be healed by the power of God or you can lay hands on the person when you ordain them. Now, I've been preaching for a long time. I was called to preach and to, to come into the fold of God. I came into the fold of, the, of God in the year of 1968. 1968, I was ordained a minister of the Church of God in Christ. I was ordained by Bishop William O. Blakely of Gary, Indiana. But when they took all of the of us young ministers, we were ministers first, and we had the call of God on our lives, and they said, now in order to be ordained, you have to go through an ordination service, and the ordination service consists of, before the ordination service, they gave you a test, and they went over the Bible to see how much of the Bible you knew how much of an understanding of the word of God that you knew or had. And upon passing that test, ordination test, to become a, a, a minister, well, you were already a minister, but to become an elder, uh, you had to take the test. And they could ask you any number of questions about the Bible. They could ask you uh, to elaborate on any particular scripture that they gave you. Uh, of the scriptures and see if your understanding was such. And so just getting up standing before the pulpit preaching to you is not just something you do. It's uh, uh, you have to study. The Bible says study to show thyself approved and work man under God needed not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. I believe that's 2 Timothy 2.15. Amen. And so uh, we were called as ministers and we were going to be ordained and when we got ordained uh, they would give you a test and back then my test was uh, not a written test but an oral test and if you missed so many questions uh, you didn't pass the test you had to go back amen and uh, I passed the test the first time around amen and in preparing for the test to be ordained, I, uh, I was at home with my wife and I was uh, about 25 years old, she was 20, and I told my wife she knew that I was gonna go for the test. She said, you ready for the ordination test? I said, yeah. Now, let me ask you some questions. I said, girl, get out of here. I'm studying, I know what you're 
He said, why do you want to be an elder or a preacher? Why, why do you want? I said, knees don't be asking me no silly questions. They ain't going to ask me no question like that. They will ask me scriptures and what does this scripture mean? What does that scripture mean? And, uh, and she told me, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. And I didn't ask him the question. I just doubted, uh, yeah, okay. Got to the ordination board. One of those elders said, why do you want, the first question he asked me, why do you want to be an elder? I like, <laughs> I like, oh my God, no, he didn't, they didn't ask me. Amen. So God gives you people in your life that can be a blessing to you, but you got to learn how to listen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Remember in the story of the Bible of the prophet Balaam had the donkey and the donkey spoke out to him. God caused the donkey to be able to speak and spoke out to him and told him, why are you hitting on me these many times? And that, that prophet was so caught up in what he was trying to do, did not even recognize that God gave the donkey an ability to talk. He should have known the donkey, a donkey can't talk. But he was so caught up. Some of you are so caught up. God's trying to get your attention, but you're so caught up in what you're doing and what you're trying to do, and you don't hear the donkey talking in your life. Amen. Amen. Look at somebody said, listen to the donkey. Listen to the donkey. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Y'all heard me preach on that before. Amen. And uh, it's kind of a funny message in the way of speaking. But I got there to the ordination. And that was the first question they asked me. Well, I got past that question, amen, and I passed the test. The next thing they did was they had all of us that passed to stand up and come to the service, and we had to had certain outfits on and so forth. I can't remember now whether it was a collar or whatnot, but black suits or whatever, and they uh, called us down, and the bishop came and laid his hands on each and every one of us. This is biblical. What's going on today is a lot of times, a lot of these folk are not even being laid hands on. A lot of people are being laid hands on, but the person that's laying hands on them are not anointed of God. Amen? Amen? So make sure when you get ordained by whoever, make sure you are anointed, or they are anointed of God. So look at Mark 16, 17 again. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues and they drink any deadly thing. It shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. And the sick what? Shall recover. Shall recover. Now when you lay hands on people, that's not something that you do just to be doing it. It's not just a procedure. But when you lay hands on somebody, the Bible says they are supposed to recover. So whatever you lay hands on them for to be healed and delivered from, when you lay hands on them, they are to be healed and delivered by the power of God because of the laying on of hands. The laying on of hands. Amen. It's powerful. And the devil does not like it because it's one of the things that God uses against the enemy, calls anointed men and women of God who are anointed of him to lay hands on people. And when we lay hands on people, there ought to be something happening. Amen. There ought to be a deliverance, a breakthrough happening, a healing. And the Bible says, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and the sick shall recover. So if I pray for you, on tonight, and I lay hands on you, you ought to have faith in the laying on of hands. Why? Because the Bible says when they lay hands on the sick, the sick shall recover. Everybody say shall. Shall. Shall recover. The word shall is one of the strongest words in the English language. Shall be. Amen. Shall be. No if and buts about it. It shall be done unto you. Amen. And so let's go to the book of Acts, the 28th chapter. Sunday we were preaching about the fire of God, and we were talking about the fire of God and, and, and the power therein.
But I want you to look at something in Acts 28. The book of Acts, the 28th chapter, and it started at the 7th verse. Acts 28. The Bible teaches us that here in the scripture that we're about to read that Paul was uh, on a ship and he was on this ship and in the midst of the ship came a storm that arose on the sea. And Paul, in the midst of the storm and the men that were in the ship with him, which was 276 men that were in the ship with him, they were all in the midst of this storm. And the storm rocked and reeled the ship. The ship was being tossed to and fro. And the Bible said an angel of the Lord came to, to Paul and said, Paul, number one, he said, except ye abide in the ship, ye cannot be what? Saved. Except, look at somebody say, abide in the ship. Come on, stay there. Abide in the ship. Stay there. Stay there. In other words, some of you are going through a storm in your life. You're going through a storm, and you're trying to get out of the storm. You're so busy trying to get out of the storm that you're going to miss your deliverance. You're going to miss your breakthrough because you're trying to get out of the storm. Amen? But sometimes you got to go through the storms of life so that God can deliver you the way he wants to. The angel told Paul, except ye abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. And then he turned around and told Paul, he said, you're going to make it. And everybody on this ship is going to make it. No life will be lost. But the, the, the ship will suffer harm. In other words, in the midst of this storm, the angel was telling Paul, nobody's going to die, but the ship is going to be harmed. It's going to be wrecked. And Paul later on said in the scripture, we made it on broken pieces. Everybody said broken pieces. Broken pieces. Some of you are living lives that you are living a life of broken pieces. Things that you thought would stand and work for you have not worked for you. Things that you thought was going to be a blessing to your life didn't and wasn't a blessing in your life. But God is so powerful, he's able to make you and cause you to make it on broken pieces. How many of y'all have broken promises? Yes. People promise you stuff and they're going to do this, they're going to bless you, they're going to help you. Amen. And they broke their promise. Some of you, your heart were broken over some of these things. Amen. But the Bible says... He told Paul, you're going to make it. Not only are you going to make it, but everybody on the ship is going to make it. 276 men on this ship was in the midst of a storm. If you're in the midst of a storm tonight, you that are listening to me tonight, I'm saying to you, you're going to make it. Tell somebody, I'm going to make it. 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 Amen. I know that the storm is going on. I know that things are rough. And the trials and tribulation and persecution, adversity and name it, you name it, is happening. But you're going to make it. Amen. So now we were talking about Paul, but let me explain to you what, we, what this has to do with the land on of hands. Paul got delivered from the storm in the 27th chapter of Acts. And then when we go to the 28th chapter of Acts, we find that Paul now was on the island of Melita. And on the island of Melita, what happened to Paul? The Bible says, Paul, it was cold there. And Paul began to make a fire. He got a bundle of sticks together. And began to make a fire. He began to put the sticks together and got a fire going. And when he reached in where the bundles of sticks were, a viper or a snake came out of the bundle of sticks and latched on to Paul's hand. Paul, you can imagine him holding his hand like this and, and a viper, a poisonous, the Bible said he was venomous. A venomous or a poison viper or snake had been, uh, latched on to Paul's hand. And the Bible says, I want you to listen to this because this is important. The Bible says, when the viper or the snake, the venomous snake, bit his hand, 
the people began to look at Paul. Everybody, and they was waiting to see if he was going to swell up. Folk are doing stuff to you, and they're waiting to see if you're going to lose it. They're waiting to see if you're going to mess up. They're going to wait to see if you're going to hold on to what you say God is. Amen? And when they looked at him for a while, they looked at him and said, hmm, we know that that was a poisonous, venomous snake, but Paul is still living. He's still walking. He's still talking. He and they were expecting him to fall out. Amen? How many of y'all know that there are people that expected you to, uh, what you went through with what you've gone through, they expected you to give up by now. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. I remember when I started church, amen, and, and, and uh, I, when I first had a church building, uh, it was a, it was kind of a raggedy building, but I was excited about it because it was my first actual church building, but it was a real old church building, and it looked like it was probably built in the 1930s or something, maybe the 20s, amen. But I was so glad that I had a church building. I was rejoicing. Somebody said to me, they didn't say it to me, but they said it to someone else, and someone else related it to me and said, uh, uh, look at him, we got that hole in the ground. And then my church was lost and found. And they said, lost and found a hole in the ground. Can you imagine what that make you feel like as a young preacher, excited about your first new, new building, even though the building's not new, even though it's older than everything you can think of. But amen, you cannot listen to people all the time. People will tell you you're not going to make it. You tell folk what you're going through and they'll tell you, man, I don't know about you. If I were you, I'd do this. No, if you were me, you'd do what I'm, I'm doing. It always got me when people say that. If I were you, I would do this. Sit down and be quiet. If you were me, you'd do what I'm doing. That's why you're not me. Amen. Amen. Well, Paul was bitten by the snake. They was ready for him. They was waiting on him to die. But he did not die. Amen. He did not die. And watch this. Here's the rest of the story. Everybody said the rest of the story. The rest of the story, the rest of the story was Paul withstood the poison and venomous snake. There was a head man of the island, like kind of like the mayor or something, of the island of Melita. He was sick and had a bloody flux. Paul came in where the man was and laid his hands on him. And the man was healed. Let's look at that scripture. Acts 28. Acts 28, starting at the seventh verse. Acts the 28th chapter, starting at the 7th verse. In the same quarters were possession of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him. He did what? Laid. He prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed. This man who was like, as I said, like the mayor, you might call him, the mayor of the town, amen, was sick and was probably dying. And Paul laid his hands on him. He was healed. And other people began to come. Other people began to come. Lay your hands on people. You that are saved. You that are anointed. You that have God in your life. Lay your hands on others. And command the devil. Command sickness to go. You have the power to do it. Amen. Now, there are people that have the gifts of healing. The gifts of healing. And when you have the gift of healing, you can lay hands on people, amen, and God will heal them. And you will have a, a record of most people, most of the people 
that you lay hands on will be healed because that gift is in you. Amen. All you have to do is be obedient to God. My father was the pastor of the St. Simon Church of God in Christ for about over 20 years or so. And my father was in a revival meeting. This was when we were very young. All, all four of us, all five of us were all very young. And this evangelist came through town and prayed for my father and let him know that God was going to cause the gift of healing to come into his hands. And many people from that day forward, when my father started preaching and running revivals, many people got healed and were healed when he prayed for them because he had the gift of healing. Everybody said, lay, lay. on of hands. Okay. You need to lay your hands on. What do you do? Sister, you don't have to add, I'm just, just saying, but what, what do you do when your son or your daughter is having a fever? And what the, what's the first thing you do? And they say, Mom, I'm sick. Mom, I, I feel my head feel out. What's the first thing you do? You start laying your hand. You don't realize that you're doing it because you're trying to feel, feel the fever. You're trying to feel, see what's going on. You know, trying to get a, a, a understanding what's taking place in your child. But really, that's a spiritual thing you're doing. Because you're laying your hands on them, on their heads, on their cheeks. You know, uh, look, baby, mama, mama going to get you some something. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get it down. We'll get a fever down. Many times that touch itself, that touch itself, you feel better. The child feels better. Feels the power of God. Amen. There's something very powerful about the laying on of hands. When I said that we're going to have laying on of hands tonight, service after the the the, uh, the Bible study, amen, and everybody should have been here tonight, should have been packed, amen, because the laying on of hands means healing and deliverance, amen, from sickness. The laying on of hands does not just heal sickness itself. It can cause demons and devils to be disturbed to the point that they'll come out. Now, isn't it amazing? I have never really read throughout this particular scripture, and I, if I did, I, I ran across it so quickly, I didn't think about this part. But when I read it and studied about the land on the hands, I saw that Paul, once his hand was bitten, now then, I want you to get this point. Paul was bitten by the what? The viper. The viper, the snake. He was bitten by the snake. And I say he was bitten by the snake. He was bitten by the snake. He was bitten by the snake and the poisonous uh, venom began to go through his body. So the people were watching him. Why? Why were the people watching him so intently? Because they knew he was going to die. They knew he was, and they were waiting for him to sweat. They know, they know the, 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 what's going to happen. So they they looking, they're waiting, they're looking. Amen. And so Paul, the hand that was bitten, I believe the very hand that was bitten and the, 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 the poisonous, poison snake bit him and the venomous came through him. I believe that very hand that was bitten was the very hand Paul used to lay hands on the other people and they got healed. See, what you're going through the trials and the tribulation you're going through, the very thing you're going through is going to be the thing that heals you and delivers you. The very thing that will cause you to bring, be able to bring healing and deliverance to somebody else. Amen. So uh, you're looking at your situation now. How does it look now? It looks dark. It looks despair. It looks like you're in desperation. But the very thing that the enemy is using against you God can turn it around for your good and work out for you. So Paul laid his hand on this man that, that was like the mayor of the city of Melita, and he got healed. Then the other people start coming. See, when they hear about what God is doing, I'm not worried about people coming to the church and, and don't worry, don't worry. They're going to come because when they hear the power of God, 
is moving, when they see the naughty and the, and the miracle signs and wonders, they're going to get here. Your church don't have to be the most beautiful church known in the city. It don't have to, have to be the most well-known church in the city, and everybody knows it. Amen. But there'll be the pathway through your door. I said there'll be the pathway through your door, to your door, when they hear about the power of God. Now, the Lord uses me in this area. Uh, I pray for people, and I pray for many people that were unable to have babies. Women that were unable to have babies, unable to conceive. And, and, and I pray for them, and the Lord bless, and things are turned around in their bodies. And he said, one couple um, here in Texas, when I pray for this one couple in Texas, I called them up, didn't know what the problem was, and found out they couldn't conceive. I lay hands on them, I said, you're going to have a child. Well, little did I know they had been to the doctor. What do they call them? Uh, those doctors? Fertility. Hmm? At the point, they were the fertility doctor. At fertility doctor. At a point with a fertility doctor. And they were going to, and I prayed for them. Long story short, the woman became fertile. They had a baby. They came, and they, I got a call. The lady was so excited on the phone. She was screaming on the phone. Said, and said, uh, uh, Pastor, I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant. Oh my God. That's before they could go to the fertility doctor. They had the appointment. They had to go to the appointment. They got pregnant. And I prayed for them. Now I'm not bragging. I'm telling you what God, how God used me in that area. Uh, there was another lady in, in, in Gary, Indiana, that uh, I don't know what her condition was, but I, she came in the prayer line. When she came in the prayer line, I looked at her, I said, the Lord said, you're going to have a child. And, and a year later, she had a child. When I came back home to Gary a couple of months ago, uh, went back home to Gary to preach at this church, she came to me at the church after I got through preaching. I said, don't you remember? I said, you see that young man right there? And, and the young man, he was a little, a little short, and he was jumping around, shouting and going on. She said, she said, this is the one you prophesied to me, remember? You prophesied and told me I'm going to have a child, and that's him right there. Amen. There was another couple, amen, in another city close by, Gary, that had the same thing. I prophesied they would have a child, and they had a child. Amen. amen. But you know what that was? The gift of the laying on of hands in operation. I lay hands on their stomach and I declared and decreed and said it is so and God did it. Amen. Someone turn to me and help me out. Uh, 1 Timothy 5 and 22. Or is it 12? Let's see. 1 Timothy. Amen. If I said laying on of hands. Laying on of hands. Laying on of hands. Amen. The laying on of hands. Lay your hand on me, Lord. Lay your hand on me. Amen. And it says in the book of 1 Timothy 5, 22, lay hands Suddenly on no man. Lay hands what? Suddenly on no man. Now what that means is this laying on of hands is talking about ordination. When you ordain a person, you always lay hands on them. That's part of the service of, of, of uh, ordaining a person, you lay hands on them. But the Bible says here, lay hands suddenly on no man. Now when I was young and, and didn't know the scriptures, uh, didn't understand all the scriptures, when I read this particular scripture, I thought it meant, you know, uh, take your time to lay hands on people, you know, don't go too fast. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> I thought it meant that. But if I found out it meant, don't be quick to ordain people. Don't be quick to lay your hands on them to ordain them. Make sure they're full of the word. Got an understanding of the word. 
and know what they're talking about and have a life behind them. You don't ordain a person that's running after everybody. You don't ordain a person that's smoking and drinking and lying and cursing and stealing. You don't ordain a person that's in everybody's business and talking and lying, whatnot. Amen. You see, they got a life first. You, you look at them, you check them out, you watch them. You, 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 you look at, them, at, at things that's going on in their lives and what's going on in their lives. What kind of reputation do they have? You don't lay hands suddenly or you don't ordain anybody suddenly. Amen. We were all around the church. I was 13 when I was ordained as a young minister and then an elder. I was 13 years old, but I was right around the church. They could check out my life. They could see what I was doing. They, they knew. Amen. They, they, they watched me. They, they've heard me minister the word, preach the word. They could, uh, they could see if I had the understanding of the word and understanding of the scriptures, so forth and so on. And then they ordained me. You're not to lay hands suddenly on anybody. In other words, don't be quick to ordain people. Take your time. You know what, what they do, uh, if y'all been watching the news, uh, uh, they, they have people that President Trump wants to bring in. What, does they, what do they do? They have a confirmation hearing. They go before the Senate or before the Congress or whatever, and they have a confirmation hearing. And all of the uh, Republicans, uh, all of the Democrats, are able to ask this person questions. He sits in that chair, and they, they grill him, so to speak. And they ask him questions. What about this? What about this? Well, what, did you, what did you do with this? What did you do with that? And that's called confirmation here. Amen. In other words, they're not going to suddenly give this man. When they put a judge in, a judge is going to be in for a lifetime in the Supreme Court. When you uh, pick a judge to be in the Supreme Court, they're going to be in the Supreme Court for a lifetime. So if a person is going to be in a position for a lifetime, you don't want to get a fool up in there. For a lifetime, you got to deal with them. They don't die until 115. Hallelujah. Amen. Look here. Amen. You gotta make sure you're doing the right thing. And so this is what we're talking about. Lay hands suddenly on no man. Don't just be quick. Amen. Just like in church. In church, you don't ordain a deacon, a deacon in the church suddenly or just out of nowhere. Why? Because you need to live or uh, watch his life. Watch the life that he lived and and see what's up. Amen. You ordain them too quickly, they may, you may find out they kill five people over in the next state. And because you can do your homework, uh, are you judging them? No, you're not judging them, you're just looking at the fruit. Amen. I heard Pastor Henry say, if you don't like my peaches, don't shake my tree. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. The Bible says that we will know them by the fruit that they bear. So, in uh, 1 Timothy 5, 22, lay hands suddenly on no man, and it says, neither be partakers of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Keep yourself pure. Yes. Amen. So this is talking about the laying on of hands. You don't lay hands, hands on anybody. Let's go to the book of Luke. The book of Luke, the fourth chapter, the 40th verse. And once again, we're talking about laying on of hands. A lot of people are blessed, and you, your blessing will be greater when you are anointed and lay hands on by an anointed person. Amen. I was blessed to be under anointed men and women of God. I was blessed to be under the tutelage of Bishop C. E. Bennett, first bishop of Indiana, Northern Indiana. I mean, Bishop C. E. Bennett. Amen. And then we were able to be under Bishop Blakely, William O. Blakely. And we were under some powerful men. And we taught, we learned the word. These men knew the word of God. 
they were they were un unbelievably uh, had a word in their spirit in their heart. Luke four forty four forty says, "Now when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with divers diseases brought them unto him." And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. Now when the sun was setting in the cool of the day, all that were there that were sick and had divers diseases. What do you mean divers diseases? Divers diseases and many kinds, all kinds of disease. So that tells me right here that there is no disease, there is no sickness that God cannot heal. Amen. Doctors will tell you that if you've got cancer and if it's in the four stages of cancer, that's it, you're out of here. We're going to do what we can for you. What we're going to do is, is send you down. We're going to leave you out of the hospital. We're going to take you to the uh, uh, what, what's the place to take you at the let you deal with the uh, condition that you have. Hospice. And they'll take the hospice, and basically the job of the hospice is to try to keep you as comfortable as possible. Try to keep you as comfortable as possible. Amen. The hospice. Amen. But the Bible says Jesus didn't send anybody to the hospice. He is here. He didn't send anybody to the uh, hospital there. But he prayed for them at the setting of the sun. He prayed for them, laid his hands on them. Now it's one thing to pray for an individual, and it's another thing to speak the word of faith. Pastor, me come up here for a second. Amen. And I want to show you something. Now, come up close. Don't be afraid to come close to them. Amen. Stop. Stop. <laughs> Okay, now, Pastor Dean, I can pray for you. I can say, Father, in the name of Jesus, heal him. I, I rebuke blood pressure, high blood pressure. I mean, you be healed in Jesus' name. Did I pray? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I prayed. But that's not laying on the hands. Now, what makes the laying on the hands so important and so powerful? Now, God will heal when I just pray, like be healed in Jesus' name, and, and command high blood pressure to be God, in Jesus' name, that prayer will work. But when I lay hands on her, what is it that doing? What's happening when I lay hands on her? What I'm doing is, this is a point of contract, a contact. And then when I lay hands on her, the anointing of God that's coming out of my hands is flowing into her body. And so that's a flow of the anointing and it's going to be greater. That's why when you pray for somebody, you do the best that you can to, to pray for the area uh, closest to the area that they are having problems with. Now, of course, we know that a certain area that you don't want to lay hands on and touch, amen, that because you're be freakish, amen. And that's why young, young men, uh, men, when they're praying for women and say they've got problems with the breast and you have the gift of healing and, 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 and you... You don't want to lay hands on the breast. Now I can lay hands on the breast of my wife because she's my wife. Is that right? Is that right? Yes. Amen. I'm not gonna do it because if my wife's on Facebook Live. But if I were to do it, it's no problem. It's no problem. This is mine. Hallelujah. Okay. Now, when the, if I'm an evangelist coming to town, I shouldn't just lay hands. Hey, glory to God. Because first of all, I won't be jumping out of the pulpit and coming down to you. And she's going to be jumping back and swinging on you. The fact that you don't play. She, she swings. Amen. Well, so now he may say to one of the church mothers, Mother, come over here. Lay your hands on her chest area. And he lay his hands on top of, of, of the mother's hand and pray and be healed. But then thank you. Thank you, very much. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But here's the point we're making. Amen. There is an anointing that comes out of your hands and flows into the body of the person that you lay hands on. That's an anointing. Ever say that's an anointing? 
That's an anointing that, that, that flows out of your hand. I don't know, have y'all have y'all ever held somebody's hand and somebody shook your hand and it felt real cold, real, uh, you know, they're like, my God, my God. Then you shake somebody else's hand and it was warm. Amen. Well, you, you know, you kind of, you're still shaking. Amen. No. Amen. But my point is that there's something, that's power that can flow out of your hands into the body of the person that, that you're praying for. And so as much as you can, you want to lay hands on people so that they can uh, 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 receive all of that healing. All of that healing goes into them. Now Jesus once prayed for a man, and he laid hands on him, actually. He laid hands on him. The man was blind. Jesus laid hands on him, and he said, what you see? So many words. He said, I see men in his trees. I see men in the tree. Did Jesus pray again? No, he didn't pray again. He laid his hand on him again. He didn't pray again. He just laid his hand on him as the man saw as he should. Now, doctors give you medicine. And on the label of the medicine, they'll say two tablets in the morning. Drink with water. Or, or, or take on empty stomach or take on when you eat. One of the two. Amen. Now why? Because they know what's most effective. They know how, first of all, they know what medicine they are prescribing. And they know what's the most effective way to take medicine. Normally it's not good to take medicine on an empty stomach. But many of the medicine, medication they give you, they may say, it's okay. All right? Praise the Lord. It's quiet in the sanctified church, isn't it? Somebody said, lay on them hands. Lay on hands. Lay on them hands. hands. Amen. We'll lay hands on people tonight. And they'll be delivered. They'll be set free. But lay hands suddenly on no man. I'm just about through. Let's see what time it is. Amen. It's almost time. Amen. I know y'all are excited and saying, praise God. We want you to go on. Go on another hour, Pastor. I'm, I'm saying this by faith. Amen. Acts the 8th chapter, the 17th verse. Now see, there are people that probably need to be here tonight to hear this word so that the next time somebody lay hands on them, they just won't be... Uh, you know, jump in to hurry up and get out from under the person that's laying hands on them. They'll be really and ready to receive. The next time you get laid hands on, be ready to receive. Say to yourself, when that man of God lay hands on me, when that woman of God lay hands on me, I'm going to be healed. I'm going to be delivered. Get excited about it. The laying on hands. This is the Bible scriptorial method. One of the methods of being healed by God. Now we can speak the word of deliverance over your life. I command you in the name of Jesus to be healed. I command you in the name of Jesus to be delivered. We can do that, but there comes a time when you need to lay hands on people. Their knee is hurting. They got arthritis in their knees. You lay your hands on them in the name of Jesus. Command the pain to go in Jesus' name. Matter of fact, Right now, whoever's listening to me on Facebook Live, whatever the pain is that you're in your home by yourself, or wherever the pain is at, put your hand on that pain. And I stretch forth my hand in the name of Jesus. I command the healing power of the Lord Jesus Christ to effect a healing and a cure in Jesus' name. Amen? Mm -hmm. He can do it that way too. God is a healer. Amen. Acts 8, 17. Acts 8, 17. Then laid they their hands on them. Watch this. And they received the Holy Ghost. Then they laid their hands on them. And they received the Holy Ghost. Who laid hands on them? The disciples. Lay hands on them. See a lot of folks talking about pattern. I, I, I know I'm supposed to have the Holy Ghost, but I don't have the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. 
Amen. Amen. How many of y'all got the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues out there? Amen. Amen. A few of you got it? Amen. Praise the Lord. What I want you to know is for you. The Holy Ghost is for you and speaking in tongues is for you. Speaking in tongues is not of the devil. It's of God. Amen. And one of the ways to receive the Holy Ghost is they came and laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Now let me say this. You don't want everybody cooking for you because you know some people are not clean. Right? You don't want everybody serving you because some folks don't wash their hands. Hands are important. Before you eat, what do your mother and father tell you? What did they teach you when you were coming up? Wash, Wash your hand. You pick up, you go to Walmart, you go grab a cart and go rolling in the store, buying everything. They'll tell you now, they have things on, on the side uh, to get the germs off your hand, get the germs off the cart. Wipe your hand, they tell you to do it. Because they, they realize that hands can be very contagious in carrying disease. Amen. Amen. Everybody say, wash your hand. Wash your hand. Amen. Praise the Lord. I remember in the in uh, communion, you see that the elders and the mothers have the, the, the uh, towels, and the elders take the hand and Put it in the water and wash their hands. It's, 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 it's a matter of protocol. Uh, they used to do it, and, uh, amen, back in the day. They don't do it too much now. They used to do feet washing. Feet washing. Some of them get a, a look at some of our feet, amen, we'll cancel the service. Amen. Fungus and everything, and praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. But they laid their hands on them. And they received the Holy Ghost. They began to speak in tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. Amen. All right. Mark 6 and 5. We're coming to a close. Amen. I want you to receive this word tonight. Get it, get it, get it, get it. Amen. Get that word tonight. Get that word tonight. Mark 6 and 5. Amen. I know the word is going forth. I know people are being delivered and helped and blessed because God gave me this word. And if God gave it to me, it's got to work for somebody. It's got to be a blessing for somebody. Mark 6 and 5 says, And he could there do no mighty work, say that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk, and heal them. Now, what happened was, as you heard on TV, you said, what happened was, mm -hmm. um, Jesus went to a place and he was rejected in Nazareth. If I said Nazareth. Nazareth. Jesus was a Nazarite. But sometimes the Bible says a prophet is not accepted in his own country. Sometimes people will not accept you because they know you. They will not accept you because they think, oh, I saw that guy here last week. I remember him with this snotty nose, such and such person. I remember when he was in this mess and stuff. And so they don't pay attention to you. So Jesus went to the city of Nazareth, and the people didn't receive him as Jesus. They didn't receive him as healer and deliverer. And so uh, the Bible says uh, because of that he was not unable to do any miracles there because of the unbelief of the people. It wasn't that Jesus didn't have the healing power and the delivery power. It was because of their unbelief. And so the Bible says he laid his hands on a few but they were healed. Everybody said they were healed. They were healed. He laid his hand on a few people and they were healed. So when miracles may not be there for you that, that particular time, that God uses you to pray for some people, 
you can know that the land on of hands will not fail. In conclusion, amen, I want you to go to Mark 8, 23. And we'll conclude this message on tonight. I don't know if we'll continue with it on next week or no, but we're talking about the land on of hands. And that's the one thing about it. I have nothing against a mega church. I have nothing against a mega church. Amen. Praise the Lord. If God wants to give me a mega church, I, my answer is, Lord, come on. Do it quickly. Do a quick work. Amen. But one thing that's a disadvantage of a mega church, if you had a church where it got 10,000 members or more, you're not going to hardly have too many laying on of hands by that pastor laying hands. He can't lay hands on 10,000 people. Amen. And if they did do it, they would have to have some elders, a bunch of elders to lay hands on them. But sometimes you want the pastor, the man of God, the pastor of the church to lay hands. Sometimes we don't know how blessed we are. And this is not to say anything wrong with the other way, and there's nothing wrong with it. Amen. Again, I, I, I would to God that I had a mega church. But then when you got a mega church, you got these mega problems, mega situation. Amen. Everybody's after you. Amen. Looking for something. Amen. The mega church is looking. Amen. See how much money coming in, what they can find out. But they, you know, but if you got a little small church, amen. Three, four hundred, five hundred, even thousands, a couple of thousand. And that's nothing, but they ain't worried about that. Hallelujah. Amen. And when you got mega church, and you rolling up in Bentleys and uh, Bugattis, and, and amen, and, amen, all that, and Ferraris, and all that, and, you know, that, that's, that's another story. But Mark 8, 23, and we'll close on this. I want you to see what God is saying, amen. Mark 8, 23. Let me get it. Let me get it. And he come into Bethesda, Bethesda, and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand. He took the blind man by the what? Hand. hand and led him out of town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. And that he put his hands again upon his eyes. He didn't pray again. He put his hand again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell it to any in town. Now I want you to notice a couple of things here as I said, we're ending on this. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. Now if I was going to preach tonight instead of teaching, I would say get out of town. Get out of town. Sometimes you can't get your deliverance because you are in a town where everybody knows you. Everybody knows everything about you. Everybody never know, know everything about your family. Everybody knows everything about what's going on in your household and everything. And so you can't get healing. You can't get deliverance. You can't get breakthrough because the folk know too much. And so Jesus got this man healed, got his eyes open, and got him seeing him right. Now the man wasn't uh, necessarily, well, he was blind, but when, when, when he laid his hand on him, he saw men as trees. Hallelujah. The power too much anointing went into him. Jesus had to lay hands on him again and take some of the anointing off of him, and he's, I think mean, he saw all right. But some of you are not going to get your, your deliverance, you're not going to get your healing, you're not going to get your breakthrough until you get out of town. Amen. A prophet is not accepted in his own town, his own country. People look at you, they know all the things about you. 
Yeah, I remember when she was 15. I remember she did that. I remember she took her first smoke. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember that. I remember. I remember. You don't need a whole bunch of folk remembering. Amen. So Jesus got the man out of town. Everybody say out of town. Out of town. Amen. He got him out of town. And he spit on his eyes. Now, first of all, that had been Sister Friday or any of, of y'all. Y'all said, no, nah, that's all. You know what? No, nah, that's all. Don't even pray for me. When you, when you saw him getting the spit together, <laughs> you would say, no, I'll I tell you what. Let, let somebody else pray for me. You keep that spit for yourself. It's something about spit that's annoying and, and icky and something about spit that, uh, you know, it, it, I can't explain to you. I used to work with kids in school. And these kids, what they what, what do you call them? They, they, uh, special education. They weren't crazy, but they were special. And I found out how special they was. And we had to learn how to restrain them. They would get real upset, and they showed you how to restrain those kids. So you wouldn't hurt them, and they, and they couldn't hurt you. And it was very effective. Well, those kids, one of those little boys, he was about six years old, came up to here to me. And you know he was short, because I'm already short. And they said, Mr. Harris, I said, yeah. They said, now, be careful with this one. I said, what do you mean? He said, you got to be real alert, very careful, because he had some problems. And last school he was at, he tore it up, and, and, and I mean, it was just unbelievable. And I said, all right, okay. Not, you know, I'm listening to the lady, but not getting the full understanding of what she was trying to tell me. Didn't get the gravity of it. And that boy, I said, uh, go over there, get that pencil over there, and bring it to me. He said, oh, 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 I said, hey, what? I never saw nothing like this. And you know, he went berserk, literally. And when I knew anything within a flat 10 minutes of time, that boy had tore up that whole room, took chairs and threw them in the air, not desks or pencils and papers, whatever. And it was, I'm, I'm not kidding, God is my witness. When he got through with that room, that room looked like a war torn area. And, and, and the sister principal came in, she said, she looked at me, she said, I got for you. I said, oh my goodness. I never, a boy that small, that skinny, able to throw desks and everything. I mean, the room literally, I'm not exaggerating when I say it looked like a war-torn area. Amen. He, was, he, was, he, he had something going on. Amen. He had something going on. Amen. So we got to know what we're what we dealing with. Amen. Amen. You got to know what you're dealing with. I got to close. Amen. Amen. But Sometimes we don't know what's in store for us, but if we have the power of God, no matter what is at hand, God will give you power. Yes. God will give you power. Let's bow our heads and our in this in prayer on tonight. Father, we thank you for the word of God on tonight. We thank you for these that have received the word. And God, we pray that as we begin to lay hands on people, that we will not lay hands on empty heads, empty hands on empty heads. But Lord, let us have the power of God in our lives, so much so that the glory of God will be revealed in us. I pray for those out there, I stretch my hands to them. Let the healing power of the Lord Jesus Christ, the delivering power of the power of the Holy Ghost, Touch them right now from the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet. May deliverance come. We will cast out devils. We decree and declare that you heal and deliver by the power of God. Be healed. Be delivered in the name of Jesus. Be healed. Be delivered in the name of the Lord. And we thank you for it. 
Amen. Amen. Keep going. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God bless you. You're tuned in to Miracles to Happen Ministries. Amen. We're located at 621 South Bay Hill Road, Denton, Texas. Pastor Frank and Deneen Hammonds. If you're ever in the area, come by. For the power of God is moving. The hand of God is with us. May the Lord bless you. Amen. Till next time. God bless you. Amen. Clap your hands and give God praise.